Hello anatomy colleagues, this is Dr. Alsup, and in this video we are going to talk the very basics of every single cranial nerve, all 12 of them. And as we move through the course, we will talk about each one of these in much more detail, and we've already talked about quite a few of these at this point, but this lecture is really meant to be a quick overview of the basic function of all 12 pairs. So what I mean by basics, we're going to include the name as well as the number, and are these nerves composed of only afferent or sensory fibers, or only efferent and, or motor fibers, or do they have both types of axons? And from this understanding, then we'll talk about the target organs of each nerve, as in what do they innervate. So this may seem like a lot, but I really hope that this feels more like a nice leisurely stroll through the cranial nerves instead. So let's just get started. All right, as you might have guessed, we are going to start with cranial nerve 1 and make our way to cranial nerve 12. So, what is cranial nerve 1? Why, it is the olfactory nerve, of course, or cranial nerve 1. This nerve is entirely sensory. In fact, it is what is called special sensory. So, what does this mean? What is so special about this, particularly, this particular sensory fibers? Uh, all this means is that this is composed of axons or fibers transmitting unique sensations. Think of the five senses you grew up learning about, but with some bonuses. So for the olfactory nerve, this is going to be associated with the special sense of smell. And you probably could uh, guess that from its name. So sensation of odors that results from detection of substances that are going to be aerialized in the environment. Uh, there will be these cell bodies or olfactory receptor neurons located in the olfactory part of the nasal mucosa, which is going to be located in, say, the roof of the nasal cavity. So you can see some around this region here. We're actually looking at the nasal septum here, so there's going to be little fibers that are in this region as well. And there's going to be some associated with the medial wall of the superior nasal concha. And these fibers will connect to the olfactory bulb, which typically lies in contact with the orbital surface of the frontal lobe of the cerebral hemisphere. And then these axons of the secondary neurons form the olfactory tract. So the olfactory bulb would be kind of in this region here, connected to the olfactory tract, which we can see here and here. So these are the olfactory tracts. It is the olfactory uh, tracts, like you can see, that we typically see most clearly associated with the brain. The olfactory bulbs and tracts are really just anterior extensions of the forebrain, making this one of the making it kind of unique in terms of uh, the fact that we refer to this as a cranial nerve. So, the too long, didn't listen version of this would be: olfactory nerve is cranial nerve one, and it will have special sensory fibers associated with smell. Also entirely sensory and special sensory to boot is going to be the optic nerve or cranial nerve 2. Now, although considered with the cranial nerves, this optic, uh, the optic nerve actually develops in a completely different manner. And really, these are anterior extensions of the forebrain uh, and may be better classified as central nervous system fiber tracts. But we are not going to do that as pretty much every other resource does, and we're going to consider these cranial nerves. The optic nerve begins with the axons of the retinal ganglion, and these will pierce the sclera. So the sclera is going to be kind of the whites of the eye in this region. So you can see the optic nerve very clearly here, this large area. And uh, the optic nerve will exit the optic canal to enter the middle cranial fossa, where there is the formation of the optic chiasm, which you can see right here. And these fibers, so they'll have fibers from the medial half of each retina decussating or crossing in this chiasm and will join uncrossed fibers from the lateral side. So this partial crossing that occurs in the chiasm is essential for binocular vision. Moving to cranial nerve 3, or the oculomotor nerve, this is going to be an entirely motor nerve. So uh, no sensory fibers associated with the oculomotor nerve. The oculomotor nerve sends somatic motor, motor fibers to all extraocular eye muscles except for two, 
which are going to be your superior oblique and your lateral rectus muscles, which are innervated by different cranial nerves. So four out of the six extraocular eye muscles. Importantly, the oculomotor nerve also has preganglionic parasympathetic fibers associated with it. So they're going to be originating here. And these preganglionic parasympathetic fibers will synapse in the ciliary ganglion for innervation of the ciliary body as well as the sphincter papillae muscle. And that ciliary body is going to play a role in accommodation, so kind of helping in terms of keeping things in focus. And the sphincter papillae muscle does exactly what it sounds like it will, which is constrict the pupils. So we'll spend a lot more time on those preganglionics when we talk about the eye. The oculomotor nerve will originate from the midbrain. It will run in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and will enter the orbital region through the superior orbital fissures and eventually split into superior and inferior divisions. The superior division has been removed here and we can see a nice view of your inferior division uh, within the orbital region here. Next we have the trochlear nerve or cranial nerve 4 which is entirely efferent or motor. This nerve will innervate the superior oblique muscle, so you can see the trochlear nerve right here entering towards the superior oblique muscle, which you can see here. And the nerve is actually named after the trochlea, which you can see right in this region of the superior oblique. So it kind of changes the direction of uh, the attachment for the superior oblique muscle. This nerve is unique in that it emerges from the posterior aspect of the brain stem. So you can see it kind of popping out here from that posterior aspect. And it will make its way through the superior orbital fissure before reaching that superior oblique muscle. All right, our first nerve with both sensory and motor fibers. And this also happens to be your largest cranial nerve, which is the trigeminal nerve or cranial nerve 5. Two of the three divisions are entirely sensory. So you have V1, or your ophthalmic nerve, and V2, or your maxillary nerve, which are entirely sensory. V3, which you can see V3 heading towards the foramen ovale right here. This would be your foramen rotundum, and V1 will exit through your superior orbital fissure. V3, or the mandibular nerve, has both afferent and efferent fibers and will provide somatic muscle fiber innervation, um, efferent innervation to muscles of mastication, importantly, the mylohyoid muscle, the anterior belly of the digastric, and two tensor muscles. The trigeminal nerve will provide afferent innervation to a huge expansive area, which makes sense because it is the largest of the cranial nerves and a good amount of its fibers are afferent. So the expanse will include, but is not limited to, the skin of the face, the teeth, very important for most of you listening, gingiva, mucous membranes of the nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, and portions of the mouth. So very important in terms of afferent innervation. The abducens nerve, cranial nerve six, is relatively simple compared to the trigeminal nerve. This nerve is entirely efferent and will innervate the lateral rectus muscle, which you can see right here. Here is your abducens nerve traveling to the lateral rectus muscle. The lateral rectus muscle will abduct or abduct the eye, thus the name abducens nerve. The abducens nerve is the cranial nerve that actually travels through the lumen of the cavernous sinus before exiting through the superior orbital fissure to enter the orbit. The facial nerve or cranial nerve 7 is another nerve that has both sensory and motor fibers and we're really getting into one of the first uh, complex uh, nerves that has a lot of different functions. Sensory fibers include both special sensory and somatic sensory. So the special sensory, or excuse me, the, it will include just special sensory in terms of taste, um, to the presulcal or anterior portions of the tongue. The somatic motor fibers are going to innervate muscles of facial expression, which you can see a lot of those branches right here, which we'll talk about more in the face session, as well as some other muscles in the surrounding areas. The visceral motor fibers, or the preganglionic parasympathetic fibers, 
are going to be destined for the pterygopalatine and submandibular ganglia, so it will initiate secretion from the lacrimal gland as well as the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. All right, one of my favorite cranial nerves is cranial nerve 8, or the vestibulocochlear nerve, which is entirely sensory, uh, specifically special sensory involving hearing, equilibrium, so we have hearing and equilibrium as well as motion or things associated with motion. The vestibulocochlear nerve will enter into the internal acoustic meatus, which you can see clearly here, which leads into the middle and inner ear region. And it will divide into the cochlear and vestibular nerve, so important in terms of the inner ear region. The glossopharyngeal nerve is cranial nerve 9 and has both afferent and efferent fibers. Again, there's a lot going on with the glossopharyngeal nerve. A lot of it we've discussed already. There, um, there will be special sensory fibers to the post sulcal tongue, as well as gen general sensory fibers for that same area. Uh, we also know that the glossopharyngeal nerve provides sensory innervation for most of the pharynx, as we discussed in the previous session. There will also be preganglionic parasympathetic fibers that originate in the glossopharyngeal nerve, which will synapse in the otic ganglion and it will be, those fibers are destined uh, for the large, sal largest salivary gland, your parotid gland. And lastly, it provides that somatic motor innervation to the stylopharyngeus muscle, which you can really nicely see your stylopharyngeus muscle here and your glossopharyngeal nerve right here. We are becoming very familiar with this next cranial nerve, which is cranial nerve 10, or the vagus nerve. So important roles in terms of efferent innervation for the intrinsic uh, laryngeal muscles, as well as the pharyngeal muscles, and we'll talk about some in terms of the palate later on. It will play a small role in preganglionic parasympathetics in this general head and neck region in regards to the tracheobronchial tree and the esophagus via the pulmonary and esophageal plexuses, but most of its parasympathetic role is associated with the gastrointestinal system associated with the abdomen. The accessory nerve or cranial nerve 11 was traditionally referred to as the spinal accessory nerve, so you may hear it referred to in that way. This is an entirely motor or efferent nerve, and we've talked about the two muscles that it innervates already, which are your sternocleidomastoid and your trapezius muscle, which you can see it kind of going in between the two right here. And last but not least, we have the hypoglossal nerve or cranial nerve 12. This is also entirely efferent. Think muscles of the tr tongue, both extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue, except palatoglossus muscle. This nerve will originate on the medulla oblongata, like you can see here on this brainstem model. And you can see how it will spread out all around this tongue region, so we're in the extrinsic tongue region and expanding into the intrinsic tongue region. So, those are the 12 pairs of cranial nerves. As mentioned at the beginning, we will talk about each one of these in more detail in either the previous sessions that we've already done or upcoming sessions, but this video serves as an overview of the basics. At this point, we're hoping that you know which ones are e totally efferent, totally afferent, or both, and kind of a general idea of their, their target organs. So let's do a quick review of an important concept regarding preganglionic parasympathetics. So the question, which of the following cranial nerves does not have presynaptic or preganglionic parasympathetic fibers? Is it A, the abducens nerve, B, the facial nerve, C, glossopharyngeal nerve, D, oculomotor nerve, or E, the vagus nerve? Pause the video if you need a bit more time, but for those that are ready, the correct answer is going to be A, abducens. So recall, abducens is a purely efferent nerve which innervates the lateral rectus muscle, which is one of those extraocular eye muscles. The facial nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, oculomotor, and vagus all have presynaptic parasympathetics associated with them, so they are a source of those preganglionic parasympathetics.
We will talk a lot about parasympathetics in this course, so make sure you are beginning to understand these sources and their destinations, and um, we will continue to review these as we go. So that will do us for this video. Thank you for your time and attention. Have a great day.